You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 199 of Healthy Critters Radio on the Horse Radio Network. Healthy Critters Radio is brought to you by Biostar US. Find them online at biostarus.com. I'm on the hot seat with some listener submitted nutritional questions. Critter of the show is the Bumblebee, Biostar's Happy Horse Awards, and would your dog or horse be an action figure, a bobblehead, a Christmas ornament, or a beer stein? Join us. <laughs> I'm Tigger. Hey, I'm Coach Jen. Patty's AWOL. Yep, as usual. <laughs> as usual. <laughs> Just taking some time off. So we're getting together again here, and we've got some fun stuff to do today. And what usually what happens when we come out of our little introduction at the beginning of the show, we have a chit-chat. But we've already chit-chatted. So we're going to go straight to the round table. <laughs> yep. The sound of is that like Knights of the Round Table? Yes, exactly what it is. That's precisely and exactly what it is. I'm inspired by watching a lot of behind the scenes footage from Game of Thrones. Oh, I don't watch Game of Thrones, I've never watched that show, but I enjoy (laughs) watching the behind the scenes footage. (laughs) The music's pretty great from Game of Thrones, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the engineer in me. Maybe it's the curiosity in me. Stuff I, I don't... tried to watch it. I, and have I you? just couldn't. It, I just couldn't. I, I wanted to. I really yeah. wanted to. And I just didn't connect with it. Didn't connect. I didn't either. But I, I really enjoy watching what goes on behind the camera or between the takes and how things get made. I love watching that part. Yeah. I saw uh, one of how the Lord of the Rings trilogy was made. <gasps> oh, that must be a good one. Oh, it is. It's in like four parts. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is the world's longest movie. It, yes, it is. Yes. But it, the, some of the background, not just the, act, the creations it themselves, but the the financing and what they went through and how they I mean it that little distributor company, New Line Cinema, just went out on a huge they took a leap of faith. Yeah. And then they sold it to the distributors with the and they, they brought uh, Jackson they, they was there was at cons and Jackson made a montage of what because he was obviously still making films, the films, right? So he put together a montage, and they showed it to the distributors, and the distributors went freaking nuts. <laughs> but New Line said, you can't just get one. You have to be in for all three. Ooh. And that's how they got the financing to finish Lord of the Rings. So, of course, we go off the rails. I'm sorry. I ask a question, and then we go off the rails. It's what we do here yes oh, no. it is <laughs> so i thought because be, we're off the rails we are let's, we are a little let's bit be off. real let's be real here As, yes lots of traveling this time of year it's this crazy so i thought we'd, we'd try something a little bit different i wanted to put tigger on the hot seat so i reached out to some Ouch. folks <laughs> i reached out and i got a couple of questions from listeners And I thought, well, we'll put Tigger on the hot seat and have her answer them because nutrition and physical and mental health for our animals, nutrition is sort of your speciality. You deal with what they consume in order to best support good health. And a lot of times something that seems obvious to you because you have a big brain to the average Joe and Jennifer like me. We go, huh? So I got some big questions from regular people. And here's the first one. This one is, I didn't, oh, I didn't put her name down. Oh, no. Um, thank you. My horse is boarded at a farm, and the farm manager won't feed more than three different things per meal. I can relate to that having had a boarding stable. 
So in addition to his quality fortified grain, is there a whole food that I can include daily that would make any difference? He's in regular medium work as a junior hunter and average keeper gets orchard alfalfa hay, but no grass except when being hand grazed after work or on his days off. Thanks. So what what can we do in like a baby step? Um, <laughs> just reading that he's not getting, you know, turned out on grass. Uh, um, I would say you, you need vitamin E. Um, you, you need vitamin E okay. for sure. Okay. And I prefer vitamin E from sunflower. It's more of a whole food, if you will. You'd have to feed a lot of sunflower seeds. So it's better to just do the vitamin E from sunflower oil. Mm-hmm. Um, without oh, so that's more. the source of the sun. Okay, source. Yes. sourced by vitamin E. Okay, yeah. This the other source of vitamin E is commonly soy, mm-hmm. and um, some horses are very sensitive to soy. So sunflower is a, uh, I think, a much better alternative. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm I, I don't know enough about this horse and what. Uh, health challenges he might be is he ulcer sensitive uh, is his manure normal um does he have any peculiarities that might need to be addressed with diet but those are all the kinds of questions that go into you know figuring out what she should add to her horse's diet mm-hmm. um without knowing the the quality fortified grain he's not getting any fresh grass except a little hand grazing you know you could add some flax to give him the omega-3s he's not getting from fresh forage Mm -hmm. flax or chia would be an easy thing to add chia has some additional benefits um it it it, it's a has a lot of mucilage so it works kind of like psyllium so it's really good when you're in a uh a situation where the horses are in contact with a lot of sand, mm-hmm. so to move things through the system. Mm-hmm. Uh, very good source of protein, and of course, it's a, a great combination of omega three fats. So, so that, I would do vitamin E, and I would do a flax or or chia. So, this is my question because yes. this this prompted something in my little brain. If you have a horse that doesn't really have any health issues. He's doing fine. But you would really like to offer him whole foods, foods that are not processed, just because those foods contain things that processed foods don't. Yep. Um is are you really are you doing that more for your own benefit or does it even something as simple as adding whole foods to your horse's diet they actually help? It's like Yes, it's like turning your horse out on grass several hours a day versus feeding them hay. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yes, it absolutely helps. Oh, well, there we go. Well, this looks like it feeds right into the next one. See that? Feeds? <laughs> I made that little joke there. <laughs> <laughs> and this this one is from Wal- Walika. That's a good name, Walika. What is the best treat for a horse? I give carrots in their feed buckets every day and sometimes by hand. And I figure I might as well give them something that's good for them. uh, That's actually good for them. So there you go. What are you going to give your horse? Carrots are good for them. Oh, well, there we go. Good to know. Um, Now, if you have a metabolic horse, (laughs) carrots probably wouldn't be my go-to. Carrots, apples, these are whole foods. So Not only do they, of course, have sugars, but they've got the fiber that helps slow the digestion of sugar in the gut. And they have all these other benefits, you know, the beta carotene in carrots, the quercetin, which is good for allergies and and inflammation in apples. Now, of course, if we wanted to use these foods therapeutically, we'd have to feed a lot of them. But in their whole form, they are great treats. A simple treat is a handful of alfalfa pellets. It doesn't sound very exciting, but the calcium content of alfalfa pellets really does help neutralize stomach acid. 
So it's a wonderful treat for the ulcer sensitive horse. Oh, well, there you go. Are there other whole foods that one might find at the grocery store that horses can safely enjoy? I'm going to use it in the treat category. It's not there to give them calories in their diet, but to add psychological and emotional interest to give them the benefits of fresh foods. Are there other ones we can find at the grocery store that we might not have thought of? Bananas. No. That's a, that's a really good recovery. Yeah. Bananas. Yeah. Now, not for the horse with PSSM. Um, there you go. But for, a, you know, a horse that doesn't have any metabolic issues, banana is a great recovery because not only does it supply glycogen, which is going to um, help support muscle recovery, but it's also a good source of protein. Huh. There we um, go. You can feed things like um, pumpkin. Now, um, when you when you give them pumpkin, do you only give them the insides of the like the pumpkin, the middle part that you make like into a the pumpkin seeds, pie? The seeds. Although I know horses that eat the rind after. Uh, it's been hollowed out and used for Halloween. Really? Oh <laughs> yes. my! I didn't know that. I'm gonna have to get a pumpkin this fall and see if any of our, if either of our horses will eat some pumpkin. I think that'd be um, watermelon. That's oh yeah, really that's good, good on one. hot days. Yeah. Um, share your watermelon. Yes, yeah, share your watermelon. And the nice part too is if you if you buy watermelon that has still has seeds in it versus the seedless, it's probably hard to find a seeded watermelon in a grocery store nowadays. But if you do get yeah, seeds, and even if you get a seedless watermelon, sometimes there are some seeds in there. Kind of set them aside and chuck them out near your muck heap, and you're gonna have you'll have uh, you'll have more watermelons next year. Then you know what to do with. <laughs> They're really, really easy to grow. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, somebody suggest I, I gave some to the other day to one of the horses. Uh, a listener had stopped by to visit us a little while ago, and she she brought some sweet potato treats for the horses. Yeah, that's getting more popular. Yeah, they these were dehydrated so they were yes. like they were yeah uh, you would not want to feed <laughs> fresh sweet potatoes they were, they were like sure. sweet potato leather and scooter <laughs> yes. scooter would eat them but nigel would have none of it but scooter oh, i read yeah of scooter course. Really anything, yeah of course he chowed down on them that's interesting i knew somebody long long time ago a, a gal who had some horses at my barn she worked at a restaurant and at the end of the shift when they broke down the self-serve salad bar because this was a time when self-serve salad bars were all the rage everybody had one when they broke that down at the end of the day all of the greens and fresh vegetables that were in there she that would they would normally throw away she put them in a big old grocery bag and would bring them out to her horses and they would eat all of it yep (laughs) yep they'll eat kale blueberries um cantaloupe again you sort of want to you know no rind yeah. Uh, kiwis that are cut up. I mean, some horses want that, you know, some horses go, ew, yeah, ew. Yeah. But it's amazing the amount. And you, you know, you can make really great smoothies for your horse. Yeah. Um, Scooter or not, Nigel will eat celery. Wow. He, he loves him some celery. Scooter won't, won't touch that. He loves him some celery. They will both eat, um, what's the long, skinny lettuce? Um, that they usually use in Caesar salad. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 uh, romaine. He likes romaine lettuce, huh. but it's not crunchy. It's, yeah, it's crunchy. crunchy. He likes romaine lettuce, and he'll eat spring mix lettuce. So these are these are not inexpensive. Wow. They're not inexpensive treats. But if you want to give your horse something that is fresh and chewy and green and healthy too, you, you know, know, you can also do mango as long as you remove the pit. Mangoes. I would never have thought of a mango. Huh. Interesting. But that's an interesting thought. I never thought to take an assortment of veg that your horse likes, veg and fruit that your horse likes, and make it into a slurry, and you could freeze it. You could freeze it and give it to them on a hot day or just pour it over their feed. Make it into a like a mesh. But that's also an easy way to preserve it because keeping fresh vegetables and fruits hello they don't last very long right no but you get it 
when it's on the sale rack at the grocery store because it's only going to last another 12 hours. You bring it home, you make it into a slurry, you put it in whatever containment device you like, pop it in the freezer, and that way you have a continuous supply of those same fresh foods yeah. that are well-preserved and your horse can enjoy himself a little mash. I forgot to mention oranges. No, oranges? Some horses will eat the peel. Mm-hmm. Some won't, but I mean, they'll literally take it off the tree. No, I never heard of that. If yep. your horse, if your I've horse, seen it. if your I horse, horse has ever eaten that. orange, let me know. <laughs> yes, they, they will. And especially if you peel it, then they really like that. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've tried to feed ours orange peels. And if yeah, memory... no, the peel is pretty bitter. Yeah. But they like the inside. Yeah. If memory serves, Scooter taste tested a little bit of it. But the big, big lumbering oaf was, was having none of that one. He wasn't, he was not into the citrus thing at all. Interesting. Now I had a question about bananas. Yeah. Having never fed my horse a banana. I fed my, I've seen people feeding horses dried banana chips, you know, little dried dehydrated bananas, little crunchies. But when you feed your horse a banana, dare you feed them the peels or just the insides? Just the insides. Just the insides. Good to know. Okay. Well, lucky we didn't kill our horse because when I was a little tiny kid, one of our ponies would eat banana peels. They'll, that's a pony. That's a totally different <laughs> animal. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and I think it's going to be soon time to get hold of Hedwig, the world's only podcasting Pomeranian. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> I hope everyone is enjoying a lovely May Day. Oh, that's right. It's May Day. It's May 1st. That's true. Yes. And pretty soon it'll be May 4th. Yes. Uh, are you are are you we all understand how time moves? <laughs> Hed, Hedwig, are you a fan? of Star Wars or any other science fiction IP? Yes. I'm oh. not as much a fan of Star Wars as Tigger, who is, <laughs> to put it politely, obsessed. <laughs> Nor am I a Trekkie like my Uncle David, who is of questionable taste on nearly every subject. But I can get myself into some Buffy for sure. Oh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Very interesting. See, I never thought of Buffy the Vampire Slayer as science fiction. Me neither. Well, neither of you is that bright. So, moving on. <laughs> what is it about Buffy the Vampire Slayer that appeals to Hedwig the podcasting Pomeranian? Well, there are so many aspects of the world building that I found compelling. For example, the idea that mid-90s high schools can exist over a hellmouth and that these two worlds can coexist and are genuinely analogous, providing a mirror for us to better understand the high school experience. Certainly something I appreciated. Also, I was a big fan of Giles because he was funny and he had an excellent accent. And I like very much the musical episode because it was funny. <laughs> so as a general rule, Hedwig, when you do decide to view yourself some television, do you have a genre that often appeals to you? Well, first I have to elbow the servant out of the way when she's, quote, working. Of course. So that I can see the screen because she's spending quality time hours in fact doing clicking on that stupid box and I, that's our tv so that's irritating but when i do get a chance to pick my own shows um you know i love sherlock it was an excellent show i wish they would make more that i'm, I'm just happened. revisiting sherlock i'm on episode Four now. I watched the watched it when it first came out, but I thought I need to go back and revisit that. I love Mycroft. So funny, so wry. <laughs> oh, goldfish. God, he's hysterical. <laughs> so in Sherlock, 
how did you feel? Spoiler alert out there if nobody's watched. How did you feel about Moriarty? You know, it was a casting decision that I really questioned at the time. But then I loved his manic energy and his sort of camp approach to what had really not been a particularly well-developed role in the novels. He was just the arch villain in the novels without a lot of development. So I appreciated the idea of a camp psycho essentially running things behind the scenes. But the fact that it was the sister who was the real villain, I think demonstrates the misogyny inherent in the original series. Yeah, I didn't I didn't like the decision to go with the sister. I think Moriarty needed to be Moriarty. Yeah, I didn't like that. Well, either. except that Moriarty was, you know, dead. So it's sort of complicated. <laughs> but is he really dead? Mm, well, well I mean, we don't know. We I don't, don't know. know. We, we don't will know. never know now because Benedict Cumberbatch is off making films. <laughs> so are you traditionally or habitually a mystery lover when it comes to your visual entertainment? I like a good mystery. I'm also, you know, I mean, I enjoy a show with strong narrative and character development. So if I get, for example, Friday Night Lights, outstanding television, the writing is brilliant, the narrative is compelling, the people are less ugly than people normally are, and also lots of sports. So that was nice. <laughs> that was nice. So besides Sherlock, do you have a current program, movie, series that you are taking in that you would recommend to other non-podcasting Pomeranians? Well, you know, there's always the Great British Baking Show, which is pretty much standard comfort food <laughs> in our home. <laughs> and because it's just an upbeat and cheerful way to spend 25 minutes. Um, and we're very happy, very happy with the new choice of hosts there. So that's going well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, I think another thing we, we are doing right now in our home is revisiting Grey's Anatomy from the beginning. Now that will take up the whole summer. Yes. Well, because we don't have a lot of time. So <laughs> um, yes, it could take our whole lives, but we are enjoying that project. And again, you know, seems to consider the relationships among generations and how they're iterated and reiterated in a medical context is one that I think is really worth thinking about. Very good. So I will put... Grey's Anatomy on my check into. I didn't watch it the first time around. I've not watched Grey's Anatomy at all, so I'll really? put that down. As, Me neither. I've never watched it. Yeah, Hedwig well, recommended. That's just so sad for you both. <laughs> well, we'll put that down. Well, thank you very much for your audiovisual recommendations to help us through the hot summer months, have our wind down wind down time, and keep our little brains from working too hard in the evenings. Functioning. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Have a nice evening, people. Watch your TVs. Bye-bye, <laughs> Hedwig. <laughs> Thanks, Hedy. Bye-bye. The critter of the show today is the what I call the humble bumblebee. I'm nuts about bumblebees, maybe because we have so many here at the farm and Right now, they are buzzing around like crazy. So I was very curious, since I don't know a lot about bumblebees, except that they're important pollinators. Um, so I decided I would explore the life of a bumblebee. Bumblebees are the only bees that are native to North America that are social. They live in colonies. They have different divisions of labor or caste system. They have overlapping generations, usually with multiple broods throughout the spring, summer, and fall. Unlike the non-native European honeybees, the bumblebee colony has an annual, an annual life cycle. At the end of the summer, the foundress queen, her workers, and her male offspring will all die. Only the newly emerged fertilized queens survive to hibernate through the winter, which I find really interesting. Hmm. The young queen, once she's come out in the spring, will found, find a new nest 
and will host up to 100 to 500 individuals. Now, the queens like a cavity to build their nest. So sometimes it's a hollow of a tree, abandoned bird nests, rock walls, but mostly they nest underground and they really seek out abandoned rodent holes because the space is warm and already lined with fur. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I'm loving these queens. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Bumblebees are generalist feeders. They're the first active bees in late winter and the last in the fall. Since they are active for so many months, they must be able to forage on a wide range of plant species in a wide range of weather conditions to support a colony. Early season and late season resources are critical as these are sensitive times of the year. So some individual bee colonies may choose to forage exclusively on a single species or a limited range of a related plant effectively becoming specialist foragers. When foraging, the female bumblebee carries pollen in a concave. This is a hairless area surrounded by stiff hairs on her rear legs. This is like a basket that can be seen clearly when it's empty, and when full, the pollen ball is obvious. Bumblebees are able to fly in cooler temperatures and lower light levels than many bees. And they perform a behavior called buzz pollination, in which the bee grabs the pollen producing structure of the flower in her jaws and vibrates her wing musculature. This causes vibrations that dislodge pollen that would have otherwise remained trapped in the flower's antlers. I think that's really clever. Some plants, including tomatoes, peppers, and cranberries, benefit significantly from buzz pollination. In contrast to European honeybees, who make large amounts of honey so the entire colony can survive the winter, bumblebees only make a small amount of honey, just enough to feed the colony for a couple of days during bad weather. Since newly mated bumblebee queens hibernate, they do not need the vast quantity of honey found in honey hives. So that's a little bit of did you know on the humble bumble bee. I didn't know that. I didn't know that bees that weren't what we call honey bees made honey at all. I didn't know. And I didn't know that the honey bees weren't native to the United States. Didn't know that yeah. either. Isn't that interesting? That is so interesting. One of our 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 soon to be humble little five acres that we'll hopefully be moving to over the summer, that one of the neighbors has put in some hives out in one of her pastures. Awesome. So that's kind of exciting. And of course, we can't wait to go crazy putting flowers in. So we're going to have a, a, we're going to have a pollinator garden because we love to watch the, the butterflies and the bees and all those guys do what they do. And ha- hopefully the, uh, the, lo- the honeybees that live down the street will be able to benefit as well. Oh, I hope you have some bumblebees. We have a lot. We have a lot of insects up there. So I know we have a lot of dragonflies. Oh, I love them. We see them. I, I always thought dragonflies needed to be around someplace Water. wet. Yeah. So there must be a pond in one of the woods that we can't see. Yeah. Because <sighs> there are no ponds in the neighborhood that we can see. <laughs> but across the street from us, there's, oh, there's probably a, close to 100 acres there, that is completely brush. It was cleared a generation or two ago, but it hasn't been touched since then. So it's all this underbrush and young young growth trees. So there might be one in there. And I know about three miles away in the state forest next door, there's ponds aplenty. But I wouldn't think that they would be that far away from the water source. See, now I'm going to have to go down for next month's episode down the <laughs> dragonfly rabbit about hole. dragonflies. Yes, I'm going to go down the dragonfly rabbit hole. There we go. So that's it. So uh, pretty cool, interesting stuff. Yeah, don't don't kill the bumblebees, please. Normally, this is the uh, 
critter nutrition segment. But I'm I'm happy to introduce Biostar's Happy Horse Awards. There, there's been plenty of controversy in the dressage community over horse welfare, particularly as it pertains to competition. Extremely tight nose bands, blood in the mouth, open mouth, blue tongues, tension in the back and body. Stress it shows for riders and horses is common. It's stressful whether you ride at training level or grump free. Elite athletes experience stress too, whether it be track and field, swimming, or gymnastics. The difference, obviously, is that these other sports don't include an animal. Many years ago, Reiner Klimko was judging a dressage show at Commonwealth Horse Park in Culpeper, Virginia. When asked about American dressage, he said, I don't think your horses look like very happy dance partners. That comment has always stuck with me. What is a happy horse in competition? Each of us is going to have a slightly different interpretation of this. A happy competition horse to me is in harmony with the rider and the rider is in harmony with the horse. The back is soft. The horse is willing, maybe even eager. The horse looks like she or he is enjoying themselves. The horse may give the impression of, I've got this. The spectators watching the horse may get the feeling of, I'd love to sit on that horse. This year, Biostar will be presenting three Happy Horse Awards. The first will be awarded at the MADFest CDI Three Star at the Virginia Horse Center, May 16th through 19th. The award will be given at the conclusion of the FEI CDI Grand Prix test. The horse will be chosen by the judge at C. The horse could be the winning horse with the highest score, or it may be a horse that places below the winning ride. The happy horse may have made a few mistakes in the the ring or not been quite as brilliant as the winning horse. Biostar will also sponsor the Happy Horse Award at the National Horse Show at the Kentucky Horse Part in November. The third Happy Horse Award, a venue, will be announced soon. Why is Biostar doing this? Harmony of horse and rider is the foundation for every equestrian activity, whether it be jumping endurance, trail riding, barrel racing, eventing, or dressage. To be sure, there are miscommunications between horse and rider and misunderstandings. Horses get frustrated sometimes, as do riders. But I think most of us seek harmony with our horses, a level of understanding and respect. Sometimes competition stress is overwhelming. Riders get tense, horses get tense. None of us are robots. I wanted to get out of the negative dialogue of faults and criticism into a more positive framework of honoring and acknowledging the horse and rider who are able to maintain harmony even at the highest level of the sport. Real horses and real dogs are healthier, perform better, and recover more quickly on real food. That's why Biostar empowers horse and canine owners with 100% whole food nutrition, supplements, and feeding programs. Biostar products are made at their own certified non-GMO facility in Gordonsville, Virginia, using real fruit ingredients that are raw, freeze-dried, or dehydrated, never cooked, and are free from artificial flavors, colors, soy, corn, wheat, and molasses. The Biostar product line includes a wide range of whole food, horse and dog supplements, treats, and unique artisan poultices that embrace the ancient and traditional uses of clay and plants. Visit BiostarUS.com today and learn about whole foods and canine and equine nutrition so you can make the best decisions about the care and health of your horses and dogs. That's BiostarUS.com. Whole food nutrition the way nature intended. And it's time for the coffee clutch. This one's my idea this time. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I always I always ask Tigger what inspired this. Well, what inspired this? I was listening to some country music station or other while driving up to get hay this morning. And they were talking about Jimmy Buffett has long passed away. He's not with us anymore. But for some reason, someone who owns the rights to make things about Jimmy Buffett has made a Jimmy Buffett bobblehead. <laughs> so, apparently the proceeds pro, pro, the proceeds 
uh, support a foundation that was started when he passed. So it's going to a good cause. It's not just money grabbing. And they got to talking about how celebrities have their own bobbleheads and this kind of thing. And I thought, well, if Nigel, my big lumbering oaf of a thoroughbred, or Scooter, our hackney pony, were to have his own swag, would he choose to be his... Because you can get this stuff made for nothing now with the 3D printers. Would he be a bobblehead? Yeah, that's for sure. Or would he would he want to be an action figure? Or would he want to be a Christmas ornament? Or would he want to be a beer stein? <laughs> I love this. It makes me laugh, just the thought of it. So you have you have a a a baker's dozen of dogs. I do. <laughs> choose choose a, a a select few and tell us what their swag would be. Uh Keen. Now tell us who Keen is. Um uh, Keen is a four year old Australian Shepherd. Um, would definitely be an action figure, no question about it. So would his nephew, the year old Kenobi, um, so named after a famous Jedi. Um, th- those two would be action figures, hands down. So Kenobi would now, not only be an action figure, Kenobi would be a Star Wars action figure. Yes. Yeah, he'd yes. have to have the outfit and everything, yeah. Oh, of course. And he'd be happy to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Christmas ornament, I think, would be Wookie. She's a six-year-old Blue Merle girl. And um, she, she, when she walks, she sachets. <laughs> She's got a little attitude. So I think she would think her face or body on a Christmas ornament dazzled under the lights would be just right up her alley. It would be a very sparkly Christmas ornament. Yes. 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 And Mr. Schmoo, who is 11 and um, is the largest Aussie at 80 pounds, definitely without a shadow of a doubt, the beer stein. <laughs> Lidded or not lidded? Oh, unlidded because he'd want to drink out of it. Okay. <laughs> he's not he's not worried about preserving or keeping the flies out. He's just gonna guzzle that. Butter. Oh <laughs> no. He he'd have it between his paws. <laughs> I don't have any dogs that would want to be bobbleheads. I think they would find that insulting. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe bobbleheads are a cat thing. Because oh you, yeah, batting you, it. You now, know, I can see a cat wanting a dog to be a bobblehead. That's true. So but I, it. I can see a cat being a bobblehead because once the bobblehead, when the head's going up and down, you can't really tell what it's looking at. It's just oh, scanning the true. room back and forth. <laughs> yeah. Yes, back and forth. <laughs> that's I, I, I think there are certain breeds of horses and dogs that, you know, are more suited to one thing or the other. I mean, like, would Scooter be, Scooter would not be an action figure, right? Would he be a a Christmas ornament? Scooter the Hackney Pony would be an articulated Christmas ornament. So he could be both. (laughs) Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay, so Nigel's the bobblehead. (laughs) <laughs> let me think would nigel be a bobblehead or a beer stein let me think about this yeah because he's you know you, you don't associate bobbleheads with anything intelligent it's kind of a dumb thing you know when you think about it exactly yeah yeah okay because he did it again today he he you know he lives in he lives practically in a sterilized environment his entire field is spotless it's four rail fencing everywhere you go. There's a fence around the bottom of the tree so they don't chew on it. The place is immaculate. There's not anything anywhere. He somehow manages to put a giant hole in the side of his leg today. How does he do these things? No. How does he do these things? I don't know. <sighs> and and poor John, who who feeds them in the morning and the evening. He's such a sweetheart. I was fixing him up and he said, but the, the horses were chasing each other around this morning. I wonder if Scooter kicked him. And I said, well, he probably did because he also had a kick mark. And I said, but d- don't don't worry about it because even when Nigel lives by himself, he manages to do these things. <laughs> He's just accident prone. 
<gasps> oh my goodness. So yeah, I think bobblehead, but he would be, what do they call that? Uh, flocked. You know what toys that are flocked look like? That weird, no. not quite velvet stuff they put over plastic to make it feel like fur. Really, really oh, cheap toy. Really, really yeah, cheap yeah, yeah. animal toys are flocked. Yes. You used to be able to get riding yep. helmets that were flocked. He would be a flocked bobblehead. Yep. He would. Now, I can see certain dog breeds that could be bobbleheads. And I can see a corgi on a beer stein. <laughs> oh, totally corgi beer stein. Totally. Absolutely. Yes. Corgis yes. on a beer stein. Yeah. 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 That's and a lab on a beer stein. A lab on a beer stein. That would be good. And a German Poodles. shepherd. Poodles would not be beer steins. Poodles would be Demitas cups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or Christmas ornaments. With special lighting and <laughs> yeah, glitter and and so would Pomeranians. There we go. They Pomeranians. they wouldn't Pomeranians would not be action figures. <laughs> no. What breeds would be action figures? The obvious ones like uh Doberman Pitcher, obviously. Australian be, Shepherds. You know, or Australian Shepherds. They're gonna be they're gonna be action figures. That's obvious. That's an easy one. Uh border collies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a great Pyrenees, great Pyrenees would be I don't think they would be they would be mm, you know what they are? No, you know, they're going to be they are going to be a are they're going to be a stuffed toy whose legs and arms and stuff move. It's going to be an action figure stuffed toy because they're big and soft and squishy, but they're strong. Yeah, I think and yeah. they're very serious. They're very serious, know? yes. Yes. There you go. Interesting. So what and horse breeds? I I do not see an Arabian as a bobblehead. No, I'm seeing a Arab, Arabian's no. wine glass, <laughs> matching wine glasses that are etched. <laughs> yes. 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 Matching. Yes. That. That's absolutely it. Etched wine glasses. A warm blood could be a bobblehead. They're all bobbleheads. Any warm blood, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> They're all bobbleheads, and they and all a have. Thoroughbred a... would definitely be an action figure. Yes, but, and one of the legs wouldn't work right. <laughs> 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 and all the warm blood bobbleheads, the little spring would pop out every once in a while, and you'd have to take the head off and put it back together. <laughs> <laughs> and and certainly the drafts would be. The, the beer stein. They'd have to be beer steins. The Clydes, Absolutely. the Shires, yes. the Gypsy Vanners. Yes. Yeah, the Frisians. Yeah. Yes, they would. That's a given. Absolutely. And the Morgans. Now, the Morgans, uh, they're not bobbleheads. No, I, I think they're going to be action Christmas. figures. I think they're going to be action figures. Really? I do. I it's think they are Christmas going to be, ornaments. they're going to be action figures that have different outfits that they can change into. <laughs> I, I would say that for the quarter horses too. <laughs> the quarter horse, the quarter horses would have different camo that they could change into. <laughs> yeah, they have such a versatile breed, and they would have weapons. Oh, you could buy a sex accessory weapons for them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and and maybe maybe even a Harley. <laughs> you know, here is a whole business opportunity. There is just staring some, us right in the face. Some young young Forget briar horses. We'll Maybe we'll not. make we'll make action figure horses. Action figure horses. There we go. Well, this has been a lot of fun. If you have a significant animal in your life that would like to be like to create his or her own own bobblehead swag. Christmas ornament or beer stein. Let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Uh, drop me an email, Jennifer at horseradionetwork.com, and maybe we'll talk about it on the show. Or maybe we'll have you on the show to talk about it. Who knows? It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> we'll see you again next month. And for people who want to ask Tigger more questions about be, about healthy dogs and horses, where can they find you? Uh, uh, Biostarus.com. It's like that was a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking of the different choices. Facebook. <laughs> Instagram. It gets so confusing. Just go to the website. Just go to the website. It's easy. Biostarus.com. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>